sense. It's, it's efficient, uh, it's, it's user friendly, it is robust. So that tells me I'm done with my research. So I have a universal <laughs> result. Gaussian elimination solves everything. Now, the one critical disadvantage of direct method is the cost. Okay, suppose we look at Gaussian elimination, that this capital N is the size of the matrix. So my matrix is N by N. Okay? Uh, so that's the total operation you need to finish Gaussian elimination. Okay? Suppose I do my Gaussian elimination on 10 to the 2. That's the biggest uh, supercomputer in, in the world now. So it's the number one computer in the world. I think the flops, uh, the peak performance for that one is 54 peta flops every second. So it's uh, peta is uh, 54 and 10 to the 15. 10 to the 15 flops every second. So it's a very fast computer. Okay, if you do that, if you compute, guess how many times you need to solve by uh, one. So ten, the size is 10 to 6, so it's 1 million. So I solve 1 million by 1 million system. How many times it needs to solve the system on 10 to 2? May I guess? <laughs> That's the total algorithms you need. Basically, you plug in 10, uh, n equals 10 to the 6, <coughs> you get some number, then divide by this number. That's the seconds you need. Okay, it turns out 12 minutes to 12 seconds. It's good, right? Not, not that bad. If I increase my size, okay, not become 3.4 hours. Okay, if I increase again, so this is 100 million, it's 100 and, you know, 140 days. So if we go to 1 billion, it's more than 1 billion. <laughs> Even if you use the biggest computer, you solve a value matrix, a dense matrix, solve it. One billion matrix should takes more than one year to solve. Sorry, sorry, it's three three hundred years. That's why I it's days. Okay, so it's no, it's it, it is a robust method. You can solve it, but you have to wait for so long to get the result. I don't think anyone can get the result. <laughs> you can wait for the result in four hundred years. No, you cannot do it. So it tells me that you know I still need to do some research. We need a efficient and a practical method, right? <coughs> for solving an AX to B, okay? So then we turn to a, another kind of method, which we call iterative method, okay? Instead of solving it directly, we do iterations. You start from a previous iteration XK, uh, sorry, XK minus one, you compute next iteration XK, okay? Uh, one method is called gauss seidel method, that still uses three by three as an example. So what you do is, you, you solve a local problem. You first solve the first equation, you fix x2 and x3, that's the two values from previous iteration, and you only solve x1, okay? Then you move to the second equation. This one you already update, so you use update value. x3, you use old one, and you can compute for x2, just one equation, right? <coughs> and then you move to the third one, you keep x1, uh, you, you, you use the most updated x1 and the x2 from the previous two equations, and you solve for x3, okay? Then you then you get all the new iteration xk, then you can continue with, you know, compute xk plus one. This can be written in a matrix form like this. Uh, xk equals to xk minus one plus b times b minus ax one, axk minus one. Uh, for gauss Adel, this b is d plus l inverse, which you can decompose your a into three part diagonal, strict lower triangular, and strict upper triangular. Now for gauss Seidel, you use D plus L, which is the lower triangular part of the matrix, okay? And you can do the iterations. Now this is something we call iterative method, okay? Now different choice of B, so linear iterative method always can be written in this form. It's just different choice of B, okay? Now here is a contradiction. I want B approximately equal to A inverse, okay? Because if B is A inverse, after one step I'm done, right? You're plugging A inverse, this A inverse cancels with A, x k, k, x k minus one cancels with x k minus one, which you have the A inverse B, that's the solution. So B, if B is just the A inverse, you solve the problem. But that's too expensive, as we showed before, right? So you want B to be cheap to compute, which you want B to be just an identity. Okay, that is cheap to compute, but that will be a bad approximation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you want something between A inverse and identity, okay? Now here are several choices usually people use. Um, Jacobi, 
the inverse as a diagonal inverse. Gauss Seidel is the lower triangular inverse. You can also use F triangular inverse. As OR is basically lower triangular inverse, but you put some weight in front of D. Just you know, improve the approximation. Okay? There are other different kind of uh, choice of B. Okay? Uh, the good thing for iterative method is the computational cost is cheap compared with uh, direct method. Suppose you have a, 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 four, a, a dense matrix, four matrix, the cost is n squared. <coughs> if you have a sparse one, it's all n actually. So it's cheaper, much cheaper than the, than the direct method. Okay? But the problem for iterative method is always the lack of robustness. Okay? It's problem dependent. So you may have you know, one, one, one kind of A, you can, you know, Jacobi or Gauss, that convert very quickly. But if you change A, it might come very slowly or even diverge. So the robustness is always a problem for the iterative method. Okay? <coughs> but uh, constructing, constructing a linear iterative method is all about how you construct this, this B. The B shouldn't be a you know, compromise between A inverse and A identity. Okay? Uh, so another way to use this B is use it as a preconditioner. Okay? You start with AX equal to B, you multiply B on both sides, so you get BAX equal to BB. Okay? And the condition number for BA is supposed to be better than A. So easier to make the new preconditioner system is easier to solve than before. Okay? Again, here the choice of B is you know compromise between A inverse and identity. Okay? After usually what we do is after we put, uh, uh, after we multiply b on both sides, we get the preconditioned system. We use something <coughs> called a kind of iterative method. Okay, it's another kind of nonlinear iterative, iterative method. You basically you are minimizing some quantity in your subspaces. Okay, but we don't we don't need to know details you know for this talk. We just need to know that uh, here the second one for any linear iterative method, you can use it as a precondition. Okay, to precondition your system, you get precondition. You, you, you will get better precondition your system and easier to solve. Okay, uh, I widely use the precondition as incomplete the error decomposition. It's from the direct method. Just you don't complete the error decomposition. You drop some small entries in your error decomposition as incomplete error decomposition. The problem for that one is again the cost. You don't have control of the cost. Maybe it's too expensive. Okay, so. What I do, the building block for my research is multigrade. I use multigrade to build by B, this B, or I, at least I use B, uh, multigrade as a building block to build a B, okay? So let's look at the Poisson equation. Laplace, you know, Laplace U equals to F, and solve it in a two-dimensional uh, 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 domain, okay? Just a unit square. After you discretize it, you can use find difference, find value, find element, whatever you want to use. You will end up with a linear system, A x u to b. Okay. Now, it's called multigrid, so you need a several levels different, of different grid. So I'm solving the problem on the finest grid here, but I start with a cost grid and go to a final one and go to the finest one. Okay, so I have, I, the, the, the solution I'm interested in is on this finest grid, but I still need this two just because I want to use multigrid, okay? So how the multigrid goes is the following. It's an iterative method, okay? Suppose I have a initial guess x0, so I plot the, the error at the beginning. Okay, that's the initial error. You can see it's very also a three, okay? Now, what I do first, I do a gauss uh, Gauss I do a gauss idea one step. So we will see the magnitude of the error damps, right? Beginning is um, almost one, it damps to like 0.5 or 0.7, something like that. It damps, the magnitude damps. Also, the, the error, if you look at the profile, it becomes more smoother than before. Not that, still also a three, but not that also a three. Right? So I do more steps, one more step, cross that up. You can see the magnitude goes down a little bit, not too much, it goes down a little bit, but the profile becomes more smoother. Okay? If I, after I do five steps, cross that up, the magnitude doesn't change much. Still, the height you know, here is still 0.5, okay? But the profile for the error, it's much smoother than before, okay? Now, when you have such smoother, you can see the authoritative part has been taken care of. It's gone. What you left with is smoothing part, the smoothed part, right? Those smoothed errors, you can approximate it well on the cost grid. 
right? Also, oscillatory part, you want to represent them, you need a fine grip to represent the oscillatory part. But now it becomes smoother. If you want to represent them, you can go to the cost grip. So I project the error to the cost grip. You see, it doesn't change much, the ship. Still, the, you, know, you don't lose much information there when it goes to the cost grip. Now, on the cost grid, I do my Gauss ideal again. Okay? I do Gauss ideal. That's one step of Gauss ideal. The profile you know, be becomes more smoother. Okay? And the magnitude also goes down a little bit. Okay? After I do five Gauss ideals, the magnitude is much smaller. And the whole profile for the error is you know, it's just like a sine, cosine function, much smoother. Okay? Now I can go to even coarser space. <coughs> I can go to even coarser grid. Okay? Now this one only has you know, nine points as my degree of freedom, it's a nine by nine system. I can solve it by direct method. It's, it's small enough, I can solve it by direct method. So it's something called cost grid correction. So we go to the, the most cost level and I do the cost, cost, uh, cost grid correction. We solve it exactly, use direct method. But it's still expensive if the cost grid is large, but usually we go to very small cost grid. And it's cheap, okay? Now after cost correction, you can see basically the magnitude of the error is flattened out. It's all zero basically. Then you can bring it back to the cost of uh, to the final degree to the finest degree. Okay, the error is you know is basically flattened out. Okay, so how efficient this can be? What you let's do some computations. So I wrote a code. This, so I wrote a code of you know let's compute the multi grid. Okay, before. Let me, let me do a comparison here. For the, uh, for the direct method, if the size is one million, we take 12 seconds. Okay, now let me use Gauss, uh, let me use multigrade to solve the same problem, to solve the same size problem. Okay, the level should be 10, dimension two, See, uh, the total number of unknowns it's basically one million, a little bit more than one million. Okay, I can solve it in less than one second. On my laptop, it's not even <laughs> super computer. It's on my laptop. Okay, that's one thing. Second, if I go to bigger problems, so the level before is ten. Right? Let's to ten to eleven. Dimension two, one, one step, one step, one step. So that's a four million problem. I can still solve it like one second. Okay? Now let me try one more. I was two. This one is is 14, uh, 16 million the size. Okay, you see, solving a four, uh, four million problem, solving a four million problem, I use around uh, about one second. So solving a 16 million problem, I use about four seconds. So the size is four times larger. The CPU time I use is four times you know, longer. Okay, so it scales linearly with, with respect to the size. It's not like in Q, it's O N. So the whole, whole algorithm, the multigrid, if you design it efficiently, it's O N algorithm. Okay, so it's very good for when you put it on the uh, supercomputer, it scales well. Okay. So <coughs> now the question is why multigrid works for this some problem? Why put multigrid works? The reason is for so suppose we look at some important equation, okay? It will solve it locally. That's the initial guess. I solve it locally. You can see all the high high uh, highly oscillatory part has been taken care of. Okay? So the local problem, the solution you dare to and the local problem capture all the highly oscillatory part. Mm -hmm. Okay? There is a inequality called the Hanap inequality tells you that if the U minus U delta on the small subdomain, the small problem on the subdomain, it's harmonic. Okay? So its gradient can be bounded by its value it's upon the function itself. Suppose you have oscillatory functions, the gradient cannot be bounded. <coughs> But only a smoothing path, smooth functions, you can bound its gradient by its value. Okay? So this tells you that U minus U delta, the difference when you do the solve the local problem, it's almost a harmonic function. 
So the message here is a multi-grid works because the high frequency is local. When you solve local problems, you can take care of the high frequency. Now you solve a bunch of local problems, like, like Gauss Sandel did, you end up with smoothing function, then you can go to cost grid. So that's, this high frequency is local, it all comes from we are solving Poisson equation. That's the property for this operator. Okay? Now the method here is I try to develop efficient and practical method to solve the AX to, e, AX to B. The arc method is robust, but it's it's inefficient when you have large size problems because it does not use any knowledge of the PDEs we are solving. Okay? multi grid is different. Okay, it's effective, it is it is efficient because it uses the use the property of the PDEs. Okay, like the Poisson equation, I know the high frequency is local, so I can use it. Okay? But it is problem dependent. Okay, different, different PDEs, you, can, you should use different strategies to handle these cases. Okay? So it may be difficult to, you know, to, to, to use multi-grid in, in practice. However, for me, that's good news. <laughs> problem in demand is, is good, right? Each problem will, have, will be a one project for me, so I can study one by one. Right, so for me, problem dependent is not a bad thing, it's a good one. <laughs> okay, I don't want to design universal solver. I want to design an efficient solver only for, you know, from, for, uh, for a class of problem if it's efficient, right? For another class, I can design other, other solvers. But I want to use anything I have to develop the solver. Not only looking at the matrix A, I want to look at where this A comes from, what's the mathematic, mathematical property behind this A that I can use. I can use everything I can get to solve AX equal to B. For example, the grid, okay? You always describe the problem on a grid, so I can use a grid to help me to solve a problem. I can use the property of PDEs. Maybe it's a Poisson-like problem, it's a Laplace problem, maybe it's a conversion problem, uh, maybe it is a hyperbolic problem. So different problems, you have different ways to use the solvers. And the web host state of PD also help me to, de uh, to develop a solvers. Okay, so whether the problem is solvable, the solution is unique or not, also give us a hint how to develop a solver. And also we, we describe the problem. So the describation also give me some properties I can use to develop the solver. So the, the following, I will give a few examples to you know, how we use different information to develop a solver. First is, I use a grid. How can I use the grid? Okay. Uh, so there is a algebraic variant of multi-grid method, which I don't use. So people do you do not use this uh, uh, different levels of grid. Okay. But they only look at the matrix A. So the matrix A will give you a graph. So there is a graph, underlying graph, corresponding to the matrix A. Okay. Then the AMG method tells you now I cause in the graph. I got I got a, a even cause the graph. So I can do the multi-grid on these graphs. Okay, that's the basic idea for AMG. Uh, <coughs> so it only uses algebraic information, so which make a, make, makes the method uh, user friendly. Okay, because I don't need a grid anymore. The grid is not you know the different levels of grid may, may not be valuable in the practice you know uh, in the, in, the, in the real world right to the simulation. You don't have. That. So if I only use the matrix A, it's you know, much easier for, for me to use the area. Okay? And it is efficient for Poisson-like problems. Suppose you have described a, a Laplace equation, you can use uh, AMG. But again, it's, a, it's just a variant of multiple problem dependent. Okay? But the advantage for using AMG, so the drawback for AMG is that, first of all, because the setup, you need to set up those graphs. So that will be the bottleneck. Okay, the quality of your, 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 your graph, the quality how you get the cost of, cost in the graph, those will you know affect your, the performance of your AMG method. Second is parallelization will be difficult. You don't have the grid available. Those are really unstructured graph, so the parallelization will be difficult. Okay. However, <coughs> so a uh, bunch of you know, these levels of the uh, grids you don't have, but you always have the grid. In general, you have the grid. When you discretize your problem, the finance level you have it. Okay. Otherwise, how you give the you need to give your code a grid, and it will give you a matrix, then you can solve it. Right. So, 
for uh, for, pra for for practice, you always have a long grid, not multiple grid, one grid. You always have that. So we should use that. Okay, use that to help us give a give an EMT method. The way to use it is not once. Suppose this disk is my is my grid. That's one grid I got. So I put a structure grid on it. This those. Uh, I put a big box on it. Oh, why the edge touch? Anyway, so I, bit, I put a big box on it, so I can use this big box, put a uniform grid on it. Okay? So I have a relationship between the unstructured grid, one grid, and the uniform, like, uniform grid that I, I construct. Okay? Then on the uniform grid, I can build this core tree. Right? I can do this uniform grid. We go back to the multi grid method, right? We can we can cause them. this is four by four, this is two by two, this is just one big box one big box. Okay? So we have once you have a uniform grid, you will have the hierarchical of your grid. Okay? We should use that. But, and this is something called core tree. And you can use you can use a core tree to uh, to, to, to manage your structural grid. And you can use that, use this auxiliary of structural grid, which is constructed based on the only one grid you get. Okay? You can use that to do the setup, set up your AMG and do the parallelization. So this will help you to you know, make your AMG more efficient. Uh, <coughs> here are some tests. Okay? Uh, this is a 2D on the solving a post one equation. Those are on structural grid I get. You can put uh, here I show another uh, 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 structural grid I can share on top of the, the only one grid. Okay. Um, so the fast phase the package I have been I have been working on for the last uh, five or six years. Uh, so the math, so the all the solvers I, I will talk about you know, most of them is in this package. So I uh, the cusp is the package developed by uh, Nvidia who uh, they build this uh, GPUs. Okay. So those tests I run on the GPUs. Because I want the parallelization, so those tests are wrong on GPUs. You can see compared with other uh, with their package, the average speed up in 2D is about two times faster. Okay, the setup part is much faster because this uh, structural grid. Okay, the solver part is not that much faster because um, you know I cannot code a code better code than them. They are expert on write, write, writing you know, write a GPU code. Okay, so if I have somebody helping you write a better code, I believe I can, you know, I can get better speed up here. Uh, this is 3D test, heat equation. Okay, uh, <coughs> the total speed up is every speed up is about three times. Okay, compared with uh, that So that's one example. Use the grid. Okay. The second example I want to show is you use the property of PDEs. Okay, that's the example I will use is red bus simulation. So here is a uh, typical um, reservoir for the uh, uh, reservoir um, on the ground. Okay? So there usually are three stages of uh, oil recovery. The first stage is the pressure of the reservoir is still high. So the pressure, the high pressure will push the, the, push the oil out of the ground automatically. You don't need to do anything. You just draw a hill, the oil will pump up. Okay? The second stage is secondary recovery, which means Usually, not, no, after after a while, the pressure will drop. It will decrease, keep it decreasing, decreasing. So it's not high enough to push the oil automatically. So you need to inject water into the into the right bath, and the water will push the oil out of the ground. Okay, that's called a secondary recovery. But the viscosity of the water is much smaller than the viscosity of the oil. Okay, so if you use water to to to, to push the oil, you will get something like that. So there are some regimes. The water is it flows much faster than oil, so it will go to the production well directly. Most of the oil still stays in the reservoir, so the, the recovery rate is not is not high enough. Okay, that's why we need a third stage, which we call enhanced oil recovery. The basic idea is you either heat up the oil, make the viscosity is you know smaller, close to water, or you put something in the water. To increase the viscosity of, of the mixture of the water, make it close to the oil. Okay. Uh, so the the particular method that I'm looking at is polymer flooding. So we put polymers in the in the water. Then the viscosity of the mixture, water and the polymer, is closer to the oil. Now it you know it it flows more uniformly. So you will get something like that. You can see the oil recovery rate will be better. 
Okay. Usually, the uh, first, the second stage, the, the recovery rate is 20 to 40 percent. But if you use the enhanced oil recovery, uh, increase to 30 to 60 percent. Okay. So that's the that's the uh, problem I want to model. Okay. So the model I use is black oil model. That's a well-known model uh, for secondary recovery. Basically, you have mass conservation is for three phases: water phase, oil phase, and gas phase. And uh, this is a Darcy's law, okay, which means in the process media, the flow rate is proportional to the uh, to the difference in the pressure differences. Okay, that's Darcy's law. And you have a constitutive law, which means that's S with the saturations. Okay, so the su summation of saturation will be one. Okay, you cannot have more than one saturations. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and uh, this is a capillary pressure. So if you have two emissible flow touch each other. That you uh, you will have capillary pressure between two two fluids, okay? Just because they are immiscible, they have different properties. And also, this QW, QO, QG, they are well models. They are they are wells, sink or the injection well or the production well, and uh, they are algebraic equations. Those are PDEs, right? Those are PDEs. This is algebraic equation, which means the flow rate at the at the well is proportional to the pressure at the well. Pressure difference between the well and the the bottom hole pressure. Bottom hole pressure is the pre, uh, the pressure at the bottom of the of the well. Okay, so the difference, the flow rate is proportional to that difference. Okay, so you see this model you couple with you couple the PDE with algebraic equations. Uh, you can also have modi modified black hole model. You add uh, a polymer, so then kind of chloride in the, in the system. So you have two extra uh, mass conservation equations, and you, you need to modify the viscosity. As, you know, that's our goal to change the viscosity. And you can also add more components. You know, just adding more mass conservation <coughs> equations. So this no, no, this function equations is the model you want to solve. Now, if you do, uh, so we use fully increasing method. Back to the OLA, find the volume and the Newton linear linearization. The most challenging part is solving this Jacobi system at each Newton iteration. Okay, why it is challenging? Because uh, different blocks of different unknowns have different properties. For example, pressure. This block is the gas equation you take a derivative with with respect with respect to P to pressure. So that's the pressure block. The operator form is looks like this. So you will have diffusion term, you have convection and convection term. And here the diffusion coefficient is much bigger than the convection, convection term. So make this AGP a diffusion domain in the problem. Okay, it's like a Poisson like problem. For saturation, if this part is saturation block, uh, the operator form for the saturation part looks like this. So you have convection term here, but you don't have any diffusion. So this whole block is convection domain, it's a hyperbolic equation. Then you have wells. It's algebraic equation. It's not even PDE. Okay, so you have different equations coupled together, which makes the problem difficult to solve. However, that's also how we solve the problem. Okay, look at the second one. So we we transform Jacobi system. We we, we start to solve them sub problem by sub problem. Okay, we we solve we solve pressure sub problem. Then we solve the saturation cell problem, then we solve the well cell problem. And each of them, because the well is algebraic equation, usually its size is small, you don't have much wells in the reservoir. Otherwise, it's called the wells, it's not called the reservoir anymore. Right? So number of wells is not so much, so the size for well cell problem is not so big. We can use direct method, LU, the combination. For the saturation, as I said before, it's a convection dominant problem for the saturation. So it's a hyperbolic equation. And uh, for that one, convection means you have flow flowing in some direction, right? So when we solve it, we're following the, the, the direction of the flow as something called order the, order the gauss adel okay? When we solve it, uh, we're, following the, we're following the flow direction. This makes the solver efficient. And pressure, it's, it's convection, it's, uh, it's diffusion dominant, so it's a Poisson-like problem, so you can solve it by EMG, multi grain method. And you have global smooth to couple all the things together. Eventually, you need, to, you need to couple those things together. So we use different properties to design this solve. Okay. <coughs> um, so here is a benchmark. It's a it's SP benchmark. 
uh, it's man-made the problem. It's, it's not a real real case. Uh, the first half here, the first layer on the top is from one layer back. The second layer is from another layer back. And then people glue them together. Just make the problem difficult to solve. That's the only purpose. Okay. You see, that's our result. We, we can solve it uh, about you know in half an hour. But that's the other other commercial software. You see, our result is much faster. Okay. Uh, this is what we do uh, history matching. So you have observed the data from the red bar, okay? So uh, the, our collaborators they have the observed data here, which is in the in the blue blue dot with the observed data. Then we do a simulation, try to match the data, the observed data, okay? So not so bad, not perfectly match, but uh, at least our collaborators accept the difference. This is this is good uh, 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 simulations. Also, our simulation time is you know faster than commercial software. Okay. Here is the result of when you do the polymer gel flooding. So you would put a polymer and a gel in the in the uh, in the water. If you only put uh, so this is the plot for the oil saturation. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have an injection well in the middle of the domain. In the middle of the domain, there's an injection well. On the left is we only put polymer in the water. Okay, you can see the blue range is not is not the, the larger the blue range the, the blue zone is, the better the uh, recovery rate. Okay. <coughs> so if we only put polymer, you can see the the blue zone is not so big. And uh, if we put polymer in the gel, you have large range of this blue zone, which means all the oils here has been. Pushed that way, has been pushed towards the production wells. Production wells is at the four corners. Okay, so you can you can see the, the effect from your 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 put polymer gels in the water to the enhance our recovery. Okay. Now the next example I want to show you is we use the well posting to develop a solver. Okay. So well posting means the problem is unique is unique solving. So you. The problem is you can find a unique solution for that problem. That mean, that's what it means when posting it. And we can also use that to have a solver. Okay? The, the example I want to use is FSI, those structure interaction. Uh, so it models the FSI models the interaction between movable deformable structure uh, with the internal or surrounding flu uh, fluid flow. Um, there are two examples I'm working on. One is the hydroelectric power generator. So the water comes in here and make the blade spin and generate the power. Another is the cardiovascular vascular system. This is a blood vessel. And usually the, the flow, the blood goes in this way and the flow out from this, 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 the flow outlet. Okay. Uh, usual model is structure, structure we use Lagrangian coordinate, uh, fluid we use Eulerian co coordinate, so they couple together. This is interface condition, so they, on the interface, the velocity of the structure and the velocity of the fluid should be the same. So they move at the same speed. And the normal stress, normal component of the stress should be the same, which means they touch each other. They can move in this way, but they cannot uh, discharge. So that's the two uh, interface conditions. There is an old method, not old, there is a standard method which is called Aperture or Eulerian Lagrangian method. We use that. And this is the standard formulation. However, this formulation is not well posed. Okay? Now what we did is we add stability in time. Okay, we add stability in time, the problem suddenly becomes well posed. Okay? Now use the well postness. We can develop robust precognition. And the reason is the following. Suppose you have a problem, it's well posed. Then this operator A, the matrix A, is as a morphism from V to V prime. Suppose you know that's his, that's the domain, that's the uh, that's the dual space of V. Okay. Then any as a morphism from V prime to V, so from dual space back to its space, will be a precondition for A. That's the general idea. So well postness give you isomorphism. So any isomorphism, backward isomorphism will give you a precondition. Okay? So a candidate will be the reads operator, which from the reads read represent, represent, representation theorem, right? That's called something called reads operator. This will be the precondition. So for the FISI case, that's a stiffness matrix. 
the precognition and the result operator looks like this. We can use that as a precognition. Okay, now here's a comparison. You can see with the stabilization, because the problem is not well posed, the performance of the precognition is much better. Okay? Without stabilization, we can still solve the problem. You can see the number of iterations grows as the size of our problem grows. Okay? So the so 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 the web closeness actually helps you a lot on the dividing the uh, uh, solvers. Okay? Oh, here's a, so this is a, a benchmark. You have a, a soft bar stick to a, a fixed on a ball. Okay, the flow goes in this way, and we'll make the we'll make the make the, the soft bar vibrate. Okay, I do, I do not consider gravity here. So there is no gravity in this system, so that's why at the beginning the bar can stay uh, can stay flat. Okay, <coughs> so you can see the flow goes that way and makes the bar uh, uh, vibrate. So that's a zoom in of the of the, the simulation before, but this time I, I plotted the mesh too. You can see the change of mesh near the near the near the bar near the structure. Okay. I can see it. I can see the you can see the change of mesh is here. This is the hydroelectric power generator generator simulation. So the I, I haven't started to simulate the whole generator, it's just the, the blade part. Okay, and also the simulation time is not long enough to produce a good movie. But uh, you can still see it, it's it spin, so the flow goes this way and it makes the blade start to spin. Actually there are some vibrate on the on the blades. You cannot see it, it's just too tiny, you cannot see it. But the, and once the flow gets faster and faster, the vibration gets bigger and bigger. It, it, it will eventually crack the grid, so the generator will be will, 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 will be broken. Okay. Uh, here is the uh, I show you the mesh. It's still the same problem. Just I put the mesh on. Uh, this is the broad vessel. Uh, I'm, I think it's not a good, good movie. Not, not, not. So the blood uh, goes in this way, okay? and it will go out here, and it's for outlets. The, what you, you look at here, because here uh, you have three outlets in this part. So the, so the, uh, so the, uh, the flow of the blood is start to make a strange thing here. You can see the red, the red, red dots here. It's supposed to be some a small vertex over there. Okay. I needed to run, run an even long time simulation to see that. This one already takes 60 hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next example is I use the discretizations. Use discretization properties to design solvers. And I'm working with uh, gems on this one. Okay. Uh, so. We look at the time dependent, dependent Maxwell equation, and then we try to find the asymptotically disappearing solution. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so here is the mathematical model for the Maxwell equation. The first equation is Ampere's law. This is Faraday's law. This is two uh, Gauss's law for the electric field and the magnetic field. Okay. That's a special dissipative boundary condition. Make the, uh, the, 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 the asymptotically disappearing solution possible by the standard condition. Now, the variation, variational problem for this one is, is, is this. One thing you need to notice is B is in HD space. Uh, HD space means uh, uh, and B is in L2 and D will be is in L2. So that's HD space. E, the electric field is in H curve space. So it's uh, E in L2 and the curve in L2. And the P is H graph. So P, P, P is a Lagrange multiplier here. And P is in L2, and the grad P is in L2. Okay? Now, <coughs> you can see on the continuous level, we have B in H D, E in H curve, and P in H grad. They satisfy this sequence. They are exact sequence. Okay? So we want to keep the same property on the discrete level. Okay? 
that's what we call H H curve, H H D, H H D grad, uh, sorry, H H grad, H H D curve, and H H D. So when we construct the finite element of space, we preserve the same property, satisfy this exact sequence. Okay, then we have discrete discrete the problem. The B, the B H, discrete B, the magnetic field will be here, electric field will be here, and the Lagrangian multiplier will be here. Now, the good thing to do that, this is something we call structure preserving discretization. Okay? We keep the sequence here. Uh, <coughs> the good thing for doing that is after you write out the algebraic linear system, it looks like this. This K, M is just mass matrix. You can think about its identity. Okay? This K is the discrete curve operator. And this G is discrete grad operator. And Kg equal to zero, which means the curve grad equal to zero. <coughs> so this property is preserved on the discrete at the discrete at the level. Okay? You can also have D curve equal to zero. It also can be preserved if you use the, the special discretization. So you have a DK will be equal to zero. Okay? This G transpose Z equal to zero, that's the special property from the boundary. Okay, from the boundary attack. So use two of these two special properties we can actually find a block error decomposition for the 3 by 3 system. Okay. It's all possible because these two property has been preserved on the discrete has level. Okay. Then we have error decomposition now. Okay. You have error decomposition, efficient solver is just how you, you know, two step up back, backwards substitution. I'm oh, sorry, one is forward substitution, the second is forward or backwards substitution. Okay, so that's how we, we are still working on that. We figure out the error decomposition, we haven't write a code to actually compute this. So that's where we learn, you know, future work. The last one is you can use everything. An example, I want to use MHD, okay? Uh, when people talk about MHD, people always, you know, use these pictures. I follow the tradition. It's a picture for the ETER talk map. Okay, it's an international project. I'm using the fusion energy. And one thing I know is the Chinese government put 16 billion euros in this project. So it's supposed to be a very important project. Okay. I know, uh, so this is the mathematical model for the MHD, incompressible resistive MHD. There are different kind of MHD, but that's what I'm looking at. Basically, it is uh, this first equation is the Mahmoud equation, Navier uh, Stokes equation, coupled with this to uh, reduce the Maxwell equation. Okay, so it's Navier Stokes equation coupled with Maxwell equation. Okay, now first, here, I said I use everything here. First is structural preserving discretization. I use discretization here. The velocity u is in h frag. Electric field e is in h curve. B is in h d, and p is in l two. Form a, actually, these three form a sequence. This uh, off a little bit. I need to fix that part. Okay. So this three, uh, in, you know, the element, the final element I use, this three forms this uh, uh, satisfy this sequence. But this velocity is still off a little bit. Just because the v itself is a vector, it's not a scalar, scalar function. If you use such this discretization, you end up with this big system. I need to worry about what. But what is this? One thing you need to know is we can prove it, it is well post. Okay. Now, once you have well post, as the FI, FSI case I introduced before, well postness gives you a preconditioner, the reads operator. Okay. So that's the reads operator. Now, <coughs> when you invert, now you need to invert all the blocks, diagonal blocks. Okay. These two are identity matrix. Or in the discrete level, it's mass matrix. It's easier to invert. But these two, this corresponds to a curve curve problem. This corresponds to a deep deal problem. Okay? Laplace is a grad grad problem. Okay? But here is a curve curve and deep deal. In order to solve them, you use grid and PD information to do that. Okay? Uh, so <coughs> that's a pretty So here I use basically I use everything. Structure preserving discretization, while posting this gave me the preconditioner. And the so in order to solve these two diagonal blocks, I use grid and PD properties. So I use basically I use everything. Now here is the performance. Re is the Reynolds number, and Rm is the re magnetic magnetic Reynolds number. 
Okay, so you can see the pre pre the performance for pre preconditioner is pretty robust with respect to those parameters. Okay, some movies. This is a MHD driven cavity. Um, so I'm solving a 2D problem. Uh, unit square. Here u is zero. The velocity is all zero on the other three boundaries. Here is uh, is one in this direction. Okay, and the magnetic field B is in this direction. The magnitude is also one. Okay, that's the setup of the problem. Um, and because because see the velocity here is one going that way, it will form a circulating flow. Okay, because the flow itself is discussed in discussed discuss flow, it will uh, start forming a circulating flow. And because the Reynolds number four hundred, not that big, but still big. You will start to see vertices, uh, vertex on the on the corners. That's what happened in here. Okay, that's what happened in here. So you can see the vertex. That's the velocity. Uh, that's the velocity field. Streamline the velocity. <coughs> okay. Um, this is the streamline for the B for the magnetic field. Actually, I have no idea it is correct or not. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, so I just show you the. I know the velocity looks right if I see the vertex, but this one I don't know. I, I don't know whether it's correct or not. I need to run more tests to verify. But that's how it looks like. <coughs> Start the phone yourself. This is electro uh, E, this is electro field. Again, I don't have I have no idea whether it's correct or not. This is a magnitude. I didn't follow the stream now. <coughs> so I know the electro field can squeeze to this direction. <coughs> we hopefully to increase the Reynolds number to see more vertex. Also increase the magnetic Reynolds number to see more vertex in the streamline for the for the magnet, magnetic 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 field. Okay. Uh, so okay, uh, conclusions. One message: When you design solvers, use everything you got. Okay, <laughs> I use you know grid, property of PDs, <coughs> postness, everything I got. Okay, there are several examples I used. Right now, there are more examples. Uh, I also want to do something else in the future, like uh, um, the robustness of the AMG. You know, I want to improve that for different problems, of course using more information from the problem. Um, generalize AMG to the non-symmetric or indefinite problems, and uh, also look at large-scale computing. Uh, also, I'm also working on developing software for other multi-physics physics problems. Like the multi-phase color cross media, that's the accumulational model. Polo mechanics, that's the elasticity coupled with dark system. Right? Uh, PMP equations, that's the Poisson equation coupled with uh, endless traffic equation. And solar cell simulation, that's Maxwell, Maxwell equation coupled with uh, an PMP equation. Uh, so those are PDEs. I also want to generalize the, uh, the result, the research to graph problems. I'm actually I start looking at that. Uh, so the Laplace problem is closely related to the graph Laplacian. So I'm working on solving the graph Laplacian problem. Also do graph partitioning and graph visualization. Uh, so the faster package, that's the package I've been working on for many, for you know, five or six years. I want to continue, you know, uh, improve this package. Okay, I think that's all. Thanks. Are there any quick questions for the speaker? Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite math book? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, uh, here with the math book. Uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Um, so, when I was in college, when we learned the uh, calculus class, we have a, 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 a so exercise, exercise book, six, six, I think six volumes of exercise book, which we call the it's the Russia, it's from the Russia, Russia guy. Yeah, I, I don't know what's, uh, I forgot how to. That's a Russian book, so I think it need to translate to English. Uh, so <laughs> I know the Chinese pronouncing for the Russia guy is Jimmy Doweiti. So I don't know how to pronounce it in English, but his exercise book is really good. Happy, uh, helps me a lot to you know, learn the calculus, but spend a lot of time you know, reading those books. Doing the exercises. Is it all of the exercises? Well, not all of them. There are six, there are six volumes, right? That's yeah. too much for me. I think I, at least I finished uh, half of them. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there are the answers. You can, if you cannot figure out, there are answer book yeah, too. So. <laughs> yeah. Are you currently interested in taking graduate students? Yeah, of course. So, are you interested? Are there any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker. Actually, wait, would you be interested in coffee? Yeah. <laughs>